Now, I personally think that the fourth concept is the most important out of the six. So I'm going to spend some extra time talking about it to make sure you really understand why it's important and how it influences the decisions you make preflop. The fourth concept basically says that the most important fact about a starting hand is the distribution of equities that it flops. And I touched on this last slide, but I'm going to say it again because it's extremely important and we're going to be returning to it a lot throughout Quick Pro. Raw preflop equity has very little to do with how to play a hand, which is somewhat different than in No Limit, right? Not to say that equity distribution is meaningless in No Limit, but the big difference is that if you dominate someone preflop in No Limit, it's pretty likely that you'll still have a big edge on them postflop as well. For example, if someone has a higher pair or a better kicker than you preflop, you're generally going to be in very bad shape postflop unless you get lucky and suck out. Now, I want to be clear and mention that dominating your opponents and getting the money in good plays a key role in PLO too. Even though the equities are generally closer both preflop and postflop, that doesn't mean that it's a huge coin flipping variance fest every time stacks go in the middle. You can still get your money in very good, but the majority of your profit won't come from being on the good end of a 55-45 preflop. It's more about identifying the ideal postflop situations for each, hand, each starting hand, and then putting yourself in a good position to play profitably postflop, which we'll talk more about in Lesson 2, creating profitable postflop scenarios. All right, so we just established two very important things. First, hand equities run closer together in PLO than in other games. And second, the most important fact about a starting hand is the distribution of equities that it flops. I also mentioned that most hands have ideal situations for them based on their distribution of equity post-flop, right? Well, there are several factors that go into making an ideal post-flop situation that we'll get into more detail about in lesson two. But before we get into more advanced topics, there's two crucial concepts to go over before we go any further. Okay, there's mainly two different ways to describe how the equity in a hand is distributed post-flop. The first is when a hand's equity is polarized, which basically means that when it flops well, it flops very well, but only on a small percentage of flops. For example, King King 7 Deuce Rainbow flops the very strong set or better 12% of the time, trip 7s, trip 2s, or bottom 2 pair occasionally, and then the rest of the time it flops a mediocre and, most importantly, unlikely to improve over pair. If you're looking for an easy way to identify whether or not a hand is polarized, just remember that generally they're hands that do one thing really well. And, in fact, I think PLO author Jeff Huang even calls them one-way hands in his book Pot Limit Omaha Poker. We'll talk more about this in Lesson 3, but for now just realize that the three qualities we'll be using to define the characteristics for any given hand are its suitedness, connectedness, and high card value. So when I say that the good examples of hands with a lot of polarity are the ones that do one thing really well, I'm speaking in terms of connectedness, suitedness, and high card value. For example, the abilities of King King 7 Deuce Rainbow are mainly limited to flopping sets. Queen Jack 10 9 Rainbow is a polar hand because its primary quality is its connectedness, and then a hand like Ace 9 6 4 suited to the Ace is classified as a polar hand because it does one thing really well, being suited to the Ace. Now, if there's anything you can take away from this slide, it's that the ideal situation for polarized hands are deep stacked multi-way pots. Remember for a second that a few slides ago, I mentioned that players' stack off ranges in single raised multi-way pots are mainly centered around nuts to second nuts situations? Well, polarized hands do well in situations like this because on their top 15% of flops, they'll be flopping a ton of equity. Plus you get a chance to cooler someone by going set over set, or nut flush to second nut flush. In the next couple of slides, I'll show you some graphs that'll help you understand this, but a similar analogy can be made in No Limit using a low pair like Pocket Fives. In No Limit, pocket pairs like multi-way pots because they don't flop sets very often, but when they do, they have a ton of equity on almost any board. Okay, so the second way to describe a hand's equity distribution is called smooth equity distribution. Now, it probably doesn't come as a surprise that hands with a smooth distribution play much differently than hands that are polarized. In the last slide, I said that hands that do one thing really well in terms of suitedness, connectedness, and high card value are generally polarized, but now we need to figure out what makes a hand smooth, right? I bet if I give you a few seconds, you could figure it out. Alright, time's up. I'll just tell you the answer. 
Hands that are typically smooth have good suitedness and connectedness, which means that there's more opportunities to flop pairs, straight draws, flush draws, and a variety of other combo draws. For example, a very smooth hand, like Jack-10-9-8 double suited, does very well in any post-flop scenario because there's so many flops that it can pick up equity on. In fact, any unpaired hand flops a pair 40% of the time, and any double suited hand flops a flush draw 23.5% of the time. And in particular, smooth hands do really well in 3-bet and heads-up pots. Now, I don't want to expand on this point too much, because I want to save it for the next two slides, and for lessons 2 and 5, where we'll go into more detail about how our hand selection changes as the stack to pot ratio decreases. But for now, I just want you to remember that smooth hands generally do better in 3-bet and heads-up pots. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Okay, so to give you a better idea of how equity distribution works, and why we even care about it in the first place, I'm going to show you two different graphs. And before I go any further, I'd like to mention that I pulled these graphs from www.propokertools.com, which if you haven't been to already, you definitely need to go check it out and get familiar with how to use their tools, because it's the only website I know of where you can figure out what your equity is against a variety of ranges, because unfortunately, there isn't a program like Poker Stove made for PLO yet. Okay, back to the graph. Now, this graph is pretty easy to read, and basically what it does is it tells you the minimum amount of equity that a certain hand has for a given percentage of flops. For example, if we go to 15 on the x-axis, and then follow it up to the curve in the line where y equals 30, you can see that King King 7 Deuce Rainbow has 30% equity or better on 15% of its flops. Right about here. Easy enough, right? Now, if you remember from a couple of slides ago, I said that King King 7 Deuce Rainbow is a good representation of a very polarized hand, because it either flops a lot of equity or barely any equ equity at all, right? Well, if you look at the graph here, you can see that against all combinations of aces, King King 7 Deuce Rainbow flops over 70% equity on 10% of its flops. These are the flops where Kings flops quads or top set, but as you can see, there's a significant drop off after the top 10% of flops. So let's check out the next slide to see how the graph of a hand with polarized equity distribution compares to a hand with smoother equity distribution. Okay, now I'll be the first to admit that math definitely isn't one of my strong points. And actually, if I remember correctly, I bombed calculus pretty bad in high school. But I don't think you need a PhD to understand that this graph looks dramatically different than the previous one we looked at. The first thing to notice is that the line across the graph is nearly a straight diagonal line, which is much different than the steep line change we saw in the King King 7 Deuce Rainbow example. Simply put, the transition from the top 10% of flops to the top 30% of flops for Jack-10-9-8 double suited is much smoother than what you see from hands that are polarized. To give you even more of a perspective on the differences between these two hands, if you compare the top 50% of flops, you'll see that King King 7 Deuce Rainbow only has a minimum equity of about 10% whereas Jack-10-9-8 double suited averages over 40% on 50% of its flops. Okay, so by now, you're probably saying to yourself, okay, these graphs are cool. Polarized hands mean all or nothing post-flop, and smooth hands consi consistently flop more equity, but I still don't understand how this is going to make me money, and how this fits into the big picture of things. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. See, Something you need to understand is that it's not like each hand is either completely polarized or smooth. Far from it, actually. I just happened to give you the extreme examples of each one, so that you have a clear understanding of what I'm talking about when I refer to a hand as being polarized or smooth. Here's an easier way to think about it. Imagine for a second that all hands lie on a spectrum of polarity, with the very polar hands like King King 7 Deuce Rainbow on the far left, and the smoother hands like Jack 10 9 8 Double Suited on the far right of the spectrum. Now, each PLO hand has varying degrees of polarity. So for example, a hand like 9987 single suited isn't nearly as polarized as King King 7 Deuce Rainbow, but it's not as smooth as Jack 1098 double suited either. So therefore, it falls somewhere closer to the middle of the spectrum in terms of its equity distribution. Now, to get a better idea of how this stuff works, I suggest visiting propokertools.com and plugging in a variety of hands to get a feel for how the characteristics of each hand determine how often it flops a piece of equity. We'll be returning to equity distribution a lot throughout the rest of Quick Pro, but for now, I just want you to realize that all of your preflop decisions need to be based on the post-flop scenario it creates, 
and that most starting hands have a particular set of post-flop scenarios that are ideal for them based off of their equity distribution post-flop. Does that make sense? Okay, let's move on then. Hey, what's going on guys? Casino Crime here. Now if you like this video and you want more, then go ahead and click the subscribe button below right now. And if you want to join me for more of my 6 Max success secrets and free video tutorials, just click the link to the right. See you inside the trainings. Good luck.